30 years after he lived and died, there are enough Christians in Rome for the emperor to blame the Christians for the fire in Rome. What happened in 30 years to turn a group of Jews into, into being Jewish Christians? Remembering who the Jews are, who for centuries had fought to maintain their Sabbath, their distinctiveness, their, their, their own monotheistic view, to now accept a man as God. Something happened. <laughs> And that something that happened, whatever that something people may say is, has changed the rest of our culture and our world to this day. My guest today is Philip Jensen. With Easter coming up, I thought it would be a good idea to talk to somebody who can explain what Christianity is in language that many people are evidently able to understand because he's changed many people's minds over the years. Uh, I've known him a long time. I've always regarded his understanding of our culture very highly and his ability to interpret what it means for faith and vice versa. I remember asking him after 9-11, uh, I was acting Prime Minister when that terrible thing happened, how Australians might react if we had a terrible attack here on our soil, which I felt at that time, and indeed the advice was, was quite likely. And he said to me, I thought very insightfully, look, I think the Australian people would pick themselves up relatively quickly, dust themselves on, off and get back to life. What they would find much harder to cope with would be a really serious economic downturn. I think his family, in fact, had been deeply affected by the Great Depression. Nonetheless, I'm very glad to have him on the podcast today uh, because it seems to me uh, that Christianity, it's important that we understand it. It's been, we even date our calendar from it, uh, and he's been very good at uh, interpreting that for us. So, Philip, uh, welcome. Thank you, John. Good to be here. Let's start right at the deep end. Uh, even in our highly secularised or post-Christian time, uh, most people have heard of Jesus Christ, uh, but there's not a lot of clarity around who he actually was. Who, he who was? was Jesus? Who he was or who he is? Right. Well, there's your first controversial <laughs> light on it. Away you go. <laughs> well, who he was was a man in Palestine, northern uh, Israel, in Galilee area, um, who uh, in a three-year preaching period... Um, divided the, the nation, built huge crowds and followings, but aroused enough antagonism to uh, be executed uh, by the Romans under uh, the leadership of the Jews' uh, requests. Um, and so that's who he was. Because the trouble with the who he was question is, what happened next? Because what the uh, people who follow him say is he actually came back from the dead. Now, secularist historians have a problem at this point because the evidences all point to a resurrection, but a resurrection points to the fact that there's more to life than the secularist world allows. So you then you move from who he was to who he is at that point because he, he's not dead, he's alive that then changes everything. Because who he is, he's God, that's who he is. <laughs> he's the ruler of the universe. He's the judge of the living and the dead. He's the one who's saved mankind and brings to us forgiveness. And who he is, is really something much bigger than who he was. But the who he was people, they're always gonna get stuck on this resurrection part. It's a pretty extraordinary concept. <laughs> it is extraordinary. I mean, it, if, if dead men rose all the time, it would not be a problem, would it? <laughs> well, something that amazed me, I, I love research. I love numbers. I love seeing people who can put data together, find out what people are thinking in particular, and then uh, uh, give it to you. Depending on who's done the research, even today in Australia, somewhere between 35 and 45% of people in this country still believe 
the resurrection actually happened. Yes. Well, the evidence for it is overwhelming. It's only prejudice that prevents us from believing it. But there's a big <laughs> disconnect, isn't there? Because whilst the majority of Australians do still say they are Christian, church attendance is very low. Uh, the gospel is mocked. You frequently hear now, uh, I'll be interested in your views later on this, I just don't like Christianity. Yeah. Um, so there's this disconnect. <laughs> if the resurrection really happened, that's pretty big news. It's huge. At least a third of Australians, according to the research, believe it happened, but it doesn't seem to have a lot of, if you might uh, put it this way, saltiness in our culture anymore. Well, there's several things about it in there. Um, I remember watching that uh, show Q&A, which is an ABC show here in Sydney because we've got people listen to you from around the world, don't they? And there was, uh, on, on one occasion, it was during a festival of dangerous ideas, which was a festival that went nearly up in a sense because someone came with a dangerous idea once. Um, and they asked the, the, the people on the panel, what's the the most dangerous idea that could be for the good of humanity. And one man said, well, if we had compulsory abortion for 30 years, that would reduce the population. That was Daniel itself. Savage, as a sex expert from the United States, I remember it, yes. Yes, that's right. And then Jermaine Greer said, liberty, freedom, which she's an old women's liberation person, so yep. that's consistent. But it was Peter Hitchens said, oh, the resurrection of Jesus. And... There was this kind of pause at the thing, and the, the, the discussion went forward. And then the chairman said, "No, no, come on, you can't just leave it there. Well, what do you mean the resurrection is a dangerous idea?" Now he, he he may have been doing that for the sake of the the audience. He might have been doing it for the sake of himself, but quite clearly, the idea that the resurrection is dangerous, it, it, people don't see they don't understand what the resurrection is. They've got no idea. It's uh, it's something Christians believe, but it it doesn't exist, so it doesn't matter. Um, however, it is because if Jesus rose from the dead, he is fulfilling what the Old Testament prophecies all said would happen, and he is bringing in the judgment of the world, and he has been established as the King and ruler of the universe, to whom our lives are totally dependent. I mean, it changes everything. And so they asked Peter Hitchens and he explained that once you accept the resurrection of the dead, nothing is the same ever again. Death is not the end. If death is not the end, how I live now is different. Justice is going to come. It just goes on and on. All the changes happen out of the resurrection. That's why Easter is so important. Well, we'll come to that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I, I know Peter. It's, it's been an enormous privilege to, because he's come to Australia several times and mm. we both wrote a chapter for a book and then he was on that Q&A idea. Um, he'd have been sincere. Oh, yes. He's, he's a very focused individual who's very courageous, actually, in his Christianity. And remember his brother, of course, was one mm. of the leading atheists before he sadly yeah. died of esophageal right. cancer. He wrote, he wrote a good book on description of how he came to change his yeah. own view from... Mm. Uh, agnostic atheism into Christianity. Rage Against God, yeah. how atheism converted me to Christianity. Yes. Although he said that was the, uh, the publisher's byline, not his. It's not his, but he liked me. Yeah. The fact of seeing, he was struck when he saw a trip teacher, a famous painting uh, on an altar, where he saw the people going to hell were naked. And it was the fact that you, you don't carry anything into the next life. The great leveller. Yes. Yeah. The judgment is as you just are, naked. It's not a comfortable <laughs> thought. No, it's not a comfortable thought. And we don't like discomfort anymore, Philip. Oh, no. <laughs> of course not. No. Um, you would call yourself a Christian. And I would call myself a very bad Christian. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm very conscious I'm not a particularly good person. Well, um, being a good person's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> there we go. That, that's the point. What is a real Christian in an age when still today there seem to be a lot of people in the media and amongst the, the uh, expertocracy, as Frank Ferruti calls them, who, who don't like it much, but there's still a majority who call themselves Christian. There is still an extraordinary proportion of people believe in the resurrection, yet our churches are largely empty. 
not empty, but they're, they're, they're nothing like they were 50 years ago, nothing like they were 60 well, years ago. What is a Christian in your view? How would you answer well, that question? What is a Christian in my view, or what is a Christian, is a more important question than the, the lead up you say to it. But I think the lead up you say to it is not altogether true either. That is, the newspapers are always about this declining Christianity in our society. The decline is nothing, nowhere nearly as much as there is in the newspapers. Newspaper readership has died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. but, but they are very big at pointing out how yeah. Christianity has died. It sounds like a flippant point, but actually it's a very, very important point. Very important one. point. Yeah, the because... percentage of Australians who profess Christianity has declined, yeah. but the number of Australians has increased because the population yeah. increased. Yeah. And so <clears throat> you move into an age of multiculturalism, well, of course the percentage is going to decline. You move into an age when Christianity has been spurned and censored, as it has for the last 50 years, well, then, of course, there's generations that are going to be less Christian. You know, that's true, but it's not as dire as people make out. And... Uh, church attendance, it depends which church you're talking about and where. Um, it's a very patchy change, but there are many churches which are doing very well. When I went to Sydney Uni in the early 60s, the biggest, Christ the biggest groups on the campus were the Christian groups. If you go to uni now, as my grandchildren are going, the biggest groups on the campus are Christian groups. Mm. hasn't changed. Uh, there are, in fact, the Christian groups on the campus today are much larger than they were in the 60s. But then again, the universities are much larger than they were in the 60s. So the statistics is, it's not as bad and dire as people make out. Well, there are a lot of people who actually want it to be bad and yes. dire. Yes, yes. There That's... are a lot of people in what might be called that expertocracy. People talk vaguely about elites. What do they mean? I suppose the, mean, the people who have the cultural heft and the voice That's today, right. there are a lot of things they don't like. In fact, they're pretty keen to paint our culture as pretty ugly That's from right. top to bottom. One of the, one of the fast-growing religious groups are lapsed Catholics. And the lapsed Catholics are often anti yeah. because of their unhappiness with their childhood or something like that. And so they can be some of the most anti-Christian people, <laughs> elapse Catholics. Now, I'm not sure whether the Catholic Church is doing well or badly in terms of its numbers around the place. I'm just saying that I so often meet in the media people, when you check out the antagonism, they grew up within that very structure of lapsed Catholics. I can actually say anecdotally, I, I, I instinctively, that feels right. Uh, I, I found quite a bit of that myself, and, and very often they were products of the Catholic education system. So they're actually, mm. actually, very smart people. Yes, that can be the case. Mm. Yes, intelligence has got nothing to do with spirituality. No, that's interesting, isn't it? Just as well for us, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, now in, back in to what case, is a Christian? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because you see, you're really wrong when you say you're a bad Christian because you're not good. I thought, you might, I thought you might say that. I'm not sure that everything you're going to say is going to encourage me. But <laughs> no, no, being a Christian is being forgiven, not being good. It's all about Jesus and what he's done for us, not about us and what we do for God. It's, it's the other way around. Um, it, it, the normal Australian misunderstanding of Christianity is that it's morality. Yeah. It, it's a kind of God morality. Yeah. And therefore, good people get the, the, the carrot and bad people get the stick. And Jesus is the kind of moral model for us to follow. But that's the exact opposite of the Easter message. Uh, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. <laughs> Not, otherwise, there'd be no chance for me. No chance for you, no chance for anyone. His death was not a a model of how to die. I mean, he wasn't the only person crucified by the Romans. Romans liked crucifying people. Thousands were crucified by the Romans. It was, uh, it was their method. Um, he wasn't the only martyr to a cause. There have been any numbers of martyrs to cause. 
He was God become man, paying the penalty for man so that we might be accepted back by God. So the essence of being a Christian is being forgiven through the death of Jesus. Now to come back to this bad death, (laughs) because I I think I understand what you're saying, but to tease something out, as a young man, I I, I stood on the steps of um, the uh, National Art uh, Portrait Gallery in London. Yeah, uh, one of my favourite places in all the earth. Well, there you go. It. And it's free. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> not English taxpayers wouldn't say that. But um, anyway, there we were. And a, a big, I was with another Australian, we were about 23 or 24. And a big, tall, lanky beanstalk of a fellow, a German, came up to me. And he had, I remember, very, very thick glasses. And he peered at me through them and he said, where are you from? And I said, Australia. And he said, oh, he said, the trouble with you British, he said, you uh, only work to live. We Germans, we, we live to work. He refused to believe I wasn't English. I don't know why, but he didn't. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, we had a conversation. I said, what are you doing? He said, I am studying for the priesthood. I will be a Lutheran pastor. And then he looked at me. He must have thought I needed saving. Perhaps by then he worked out I was Australian and thought I was a heathen. So he said, God is love. And I thought, well, my understanding is that God is perfect love and perfect justice. And the two are important. He said, no, God is love. So I said, does that mean an Adolf Hitler will be in heaven? He said, of course, because God is love. All will be forgiven. And I said, well, then where's justice? What do you say about the people he put through the gas chambers? And they weren't all Jews, of course. They were homosexuals that he didn't like. They were disabled. They were gypsies, the whole bit. How do we hold that tension? See, uh, there'd be a lot of people who say, well, if, if, if this God you believe in is love, well, surely he's going to forgive me. Mm-hmm. But and a, a Christian, I think, would say that he does love you, but until someone's paid the price for those sins, the things you've done wrong, he can't have you in his presence. The proof of his love is that resurrection, that cross, that death and that resurrection. Absolutely. He's left out. In your accounting of his story, he's, exactly, <laughs> he's, which is accurate, he's left out the cross. Yeah, because without the cross, uh, see, the cross is the is the sign of both God's love and God's wrath, God's anger. Right, because for God to love, He will be angry with our sinfulness, with our rejection, with our wrecking of each other, with our wrecking of His world. For him to love and not to be angry is not to be loving. See, if you can read the accounts of the Holocaust and not be angry, you're morally sick. Mm. You, you, are, you have a problem. Right? And if that's true of a human, how much true of God that he will be angry with what is done? Now, for you and me, I have to go out to the Holocaust to find something we're going to agree about to be angry on. God being perfect, my lies and and your selfishness is enough to make him angry. Now, it's the cross where the anger of God is to be found. And it's the cross where the forgiveness of God is to be found. If we reject the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and stand on our own two feet, well, there's only the anger of God available to us. There would be a lot of really very decent people who would say, I don't want to know about a God who's angry. I'm angry enough with myself or disappointed enough with myself. Life's been tough. I want to know about a God who cares. Well, I might want to know all kinds of things, but the truth is the truth. I I want to be able to fly without an aeroplane. I want to be able to run 100 yards in in three seconds. I want, I mean, I can want all I want. It's an irrelevance. What's the truth is the question. And we're an age that perhaps operates more at the level of the emotion than clear thinking. Well, that's true. And a lot of people would say, well, religion's not for clear thinking. It's about feelings. Yeah, well, more fool them. It's it's true that people want to be uh, maybe not doing the hard thinking. But it's not really that hard thinking. It's got to do with sin. Am I going to rule the world or is God going to rule the world? When I say, I want a God who, what I'm really saying is, I want to be God. 
God is answerable to me. I am making up God the way I want God to be. Well, that's not God. <laughs> that's what that's called sin. Sin is when we eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means when we come to be the determiners of good and evil, when I make the rules. That's why you have really good moral citizens who are completely spiritual degenerates. And they think that because they're moral citizens that they'll be acceptable to God. But their whole life is lived in rebellion against God. So why would they be acceptable? The good sailor. You know the good sailor. Everything he does is what the captain orders, always stays awake on duty, always looks after his fellow sailors, never stays on shore too late, gets back on time, does everything that you should ever require a sailor to. But he actually happens to be on a pirate ship. He's really flying under the skull and crossbones. So at this point, the fact that he's good only makes the piracy worse. You know? The question is not how am I in treating one person or another person, it's the question which flag am I flying under? Am I under my own flag or under God's? Am I in rebellion? If I reject Jesus' death because you know I don't want a God who's angry and I don't want God paying the penalties for me, etc., well, I'm rejecting the only hope I have of forgiveness. This raises in my mind, anyway, um, the great apologist C.S. Lewis said the thing that blocked him, and I want to come to what blocks people from mm -hmm. believing in a minute, but for many is what blocked him was what he saw as the jealousness of God, the Old Testament God yeah. who wanted to say, you people belong to me and you will meet my standards. And he thought, I don't want to believe in a jealous God. And then he came to change his mind dramatically. Why would he have changed his mind? Why would he have decided that a jealous God? I haven't read him on that, so I don't know why he did. But why should we? Why could we? Well, the word jealousy is the same as the word zealous. It's, 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 it's a God who really passionately is concerned for things. Well, I don't want an indifferent God. I mean, whether I want him or not, the point is he's not an indifferent God. God, God, not the God who made the world and now lets us get on with it. God is the mm. God who cares for every aspect of our lives. And so, yes, he's zealous, he's, he's passionate, he's concerned for us. All right. So that was, that was the issue that he had. Yeah. Now let's, if I can make an observation here, one of the things that strikes me is that Christianity's been, the, it was the same yesterday, the same today and the same tomorrow. Yeah. The core message has never changed. Our reaction to it, though, or at least the reasons we give to, for, for our reactions have changed hugely. We talked about C.S. Lewis. That was his problem. You've been active in, in this space now for, mm -hmm. can I politely say, quite a few years. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> You've seen ma massive changes in Australia. You've yes. been very active on our campuses. You're very well known uh, for your work amongst uh, uh, seeking to persuade, if I can put it that way, young Australians. Uh, of, of the merits of Christian faith, uh, and uh, you argued with enormous intellectual horsepower. I felt and still feel, and you're an astute observer. What's changed, and where do we see it coming out in terms of people's reasoning for not accepting the Christian gospel? Well, in one sense, it doesn't change. Like the message doesn't change, people's response doesn't. That is, it's basically, I want to live my life my way. Why I want, what argument I'll use may change, but what lies behind the arguments is that self-determination. Well, that's very big in today's culture. Yes. Look inward, find <laughs> yourself. Yes, but it was always there. That was... That is, you know, I mean, for the young university graduate, careerism or sex was the temptation in the 60s is the temptation in the 2020s. It's the same. Nothing's moved. 
the arguments that are used to cover this, well, they shift around, yes. Um, but what we've got to do is get past the arguments down mm. to the heart of the matter. Because that's where the problem is, not in the arguments. The arguments are smoke screens, by and large. It's interesting, to, in as much as I understand where people like Richard Dawkins are coming from, the interesting thing about it is there's absolutely nothing new in it. No, nothing. And yet people sort of embrace it as though this is some new great new revelation. Yeah, in yeah, fact... Yeah. You uh, can find it in Epicurus. Uh, you know, it's, as, it's as old as, yeah. as, old, as old. Yeah. But people won't take the arguments that he and other people put seriously. So you see, he, he says there is no good, there is no evil. There it just is. Well, if you take that seriously... Why are we locking up pedophiles? Yeah. I would also say, why <laughs> yeah. do we feel such deep personal pain when there's sadness in our lives? Yeah. If it's just in the genes. Yeah. It's just an accident. Yeah. Why, why then does it matter? Yeah, so they, they don't take their arguments on, on ethical issues seriously. So uh, there's a book by Peter Singer on ethics, which is a basic book. The last chapter is on the critical question, that is meta-ethics. How do you know there is a right or wrong? And in the end he says, well, there is no reason. Why should I be, I think it's called, why should I be moral? And the answer is, there's no reason to. Well, if that was the first chapter of the book, no one would have read the rest of the book. You know, it's, 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 it's a waste of space and time. The whole book's a waste of space and time if there's no reason. He, he even puts forward that the, uh, uh, the psychopath is as logical as anybody else. So, <laughs> but, yeah. so the, the atheists won't be truly atheist is mm. the big problem. Mm. It, it's, it's still smokescreen for I want to live my life without anybody like God interfering with me. Mm. Well, if he doesn't interfere with you, you're lost. Let's then come to... And I know there will be listeners because they'll contact me and say this, and I want to be sympathetic on on the behalf of those listeners who who will who will say, "Look, I'm I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm I genuinely can't believe there's a divine being out there. I've struggled with it all my life." There's that group of people, and uh, there'll be another group of people who will feel we're just being cruel and 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 too clever by half in attacking their atheism. And there'll be those who, are, who frankly have been so burnt by their experiences at the hands of people who have purported to be Christian, whether it's been in some institution or a school or whatever, that they're really grappling. And the Christ you talk about, as I see it, was very, very blunt when he meant, met with pomposity and with superficiality, unbelievably tender when he met with people who were deeply hurting or uncertain. What do we say to the people who, who for whatever reason, really feel they can't believe in a divine being? Well, those ones, I'd say, read about Jesus. Because you start with what you can. I mean, in education, you move from the known to the unknown. Um, the known is Jesus of history. And the more you read of Jesus and then put him in his context of the Old Testament, you'll come to see there's really no alternative. But you start with Jesus. Right. And, and to those who have been deeply hurt, really hurt, and, and you and I have met them. Yeah, well, we've got to, we've got to meet them as hurt people. Yeah. Uh, there's, no, there's no intellectual answer to people's hurt. No. There's the experience of... Um, other people loving them and caring for them. Um, I'm mm. sorry, I'm very sorry if anybody has been hurt in the name of Jesus. I know there are. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a great shame. It's a really bad thing. Mm. Um, but we're not going to solve that with an intellectual argument because their emotional hurts. That's solved by them meeting up with other Christian people who who can show the love that the former ones should have shown them. But withdrawing from it is not going to solve your their problems. But I can understand why they don't want to engage a second time. Mm. 
Well, I, I have to say, so can I. Uh, and nothing troubles me more than somebody who earnestly seeks and doesn't seem to be able to find. And I have met those people. Mm. I find that very troubling. Mm. Um, come to our society's attitude towards death. Uh, COVID has reminded us of our mortality. And by the way, I think too, of the reality that we're not in control in the way that we like to think we are. Yes, that's true. Mm. Uh, Ukraine, uh, their bravery, but also the horrors of it all, remind us again that we're not as secure as we might think we are and that we're being unwise if we don't stop and grapple with the question that life doesn't go on forever. What is this, uh, where do you think we're at in terms of our post-Christian understanding of, of death and of the meaning and purpose of life? But I don't think these things have affected Australians much. Right. Um, the COVID deaths are very small in percentage numbers. Um, and the people who have died are old people who uh, are, are not... When you take an old person's funeral, they're usually very small. When you take a young person's funeral, they're very large. And so you get people dying in their 80s, in their 90s. Not many people know them anymore. Sadly, not many people care about them anymore. And there's a sense in which people will say, oh, well, he's had a good innings. He's, you know, he's 90. And so when you see most of the deaths are there, the media haven't been helpful at all, but then that's normal um, because... They don't give you names, they only give you numbers. So you never point. actually see people as people have died. I think people are much more struck by the death of uh, uh, Miss Kitchen and the death of, of Shane Warne. Because 52 years old and I know him. Yeah. I don't know him, of course. Yeah. But you feel you do. <laughs> but you have a feeling that you do. Mm. And so people are really rocked by Warney dying. But by, you know, seven people in their 80s died yesterday. Mm. Now, if that was your granny, it would affect you. Um, so I don't think COVID's really had much of an impact in getting people to rethink death. I think not being in control... Yes, it's affected us that way, and I can't live the way I like to live, but I've got to wear masks or I've got to not get on public trends. can't just jump on a plane. I, you know, my chance of getting my famous photo of the Taj Mahal is not going to happen now, and those kinds of things. But, you know, that's relatively superficial nonsense. I actually think there was a change over the course of COVID. We're, you know, we're quite a way into it now. Initially, I was struck by the way in which people wanted governments to protect them. Yes. And I thought I saw that as sort of, yes. to some extent, a reflection of we don't want to do yeah. death. We don't want to... Yes, because we danger. heard the numbers in Italy and yeah. the numbers in, in yeah. Britain, yeah. and they were high. Yeah. But now, two years later, I don't know the, the figure, but the number in Australia is 1% mm. or something or other. It's, it's tiny. And... That's the percentage of people who would have died anyway. Actually, um, lifespans have gone up because of all yes. sorts of other deaths <laughs> yeah, not happening. Yes. Although there'll be a time lag there because of delayed surgeries and so forth try, as we try to preserve. Um, but there's another aspect there that I think is very interesting, the pragmatic side of Australians, which you talked about after 9-11. Mm. Mm. Um, I think the Australian people decided before the governments of the country, the politicians of the country did, we have to live with this now. We've got to get back yes. to life. Yeah. Do you think that's right? I, I suspect so. We weren't in communication with each other anymore. So <laughs> it's hard to know. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> but, yeah. but yes, I think people did get pretty sick of the regulations. And yes. uh, once the Delta thing passed, mm. I think people really were quite happy to get rid of the restrictions and get back out in life. The, the young adults, I, I live out in the young adult part of Sydney. And, um, Does that uh, make you feel better? Uh, no. And, <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're charging back you know, down to the beach, into the cat coffee shops, etc. It was pretty quick. Yeah. They, 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 and they get COVID, but not, not severely. 
In the Ukrainian contest, it's been interesting to see that only a narrow majority of Americans say that confronted with a Ukrainian situation, they'd stay yeah. and fight. In Australia, a poll of over a thousand people found that the first response from a lot of people, in fact, more than half, if they had a Ukrainian situation, would be they'd skip. Yes. I don't actually think you could rely on that too heavily. No, it's the Oxford debate. Of the it's 90s. the Oxford debate. Yes. People don't know about that. But uh, there was a famous debate in Oxford in um, February 1933 where uh, the, the topic was that this house would under no circumstances die for king and country. Yeah. And the affirmative won overwhelmingly. Churchill always believed that that had encouraged uh, Hitler. Hitler and subsequently the Japanese. And for other reasons, they thought the Americans were soft, that they wouldn't stand up for their culture. Mm. We've done a lot of denigrating of our culture and particularly, uh, you know, any sense that it might have sprung from Christianity. It's pretty deeply imbued in our education system. Uh, yes, it I think, seems I think to me. we're in a different cultural position than they were in Britain in the, in the 1930s. Um, uh, the, the depth of, of British patriotism is great, whereas I don't think the depth of Australian patriotism is as great. Um, but uh, I think the Ukraine situation uh, is one that uh, people are horrified by, but it's the other side of the world. Yeah. It's not going to happen here. I personally have a different view. I bet I'm not disagreeing well, not, with that. Not the time to pursue that. I think I, that's what mm, people are thinking. Mm. I, I'm sure you're right. Um, you, the 2018 Queen's Birthday Lecture. Yep. Uh, you argued that uh, all cultures are cultures of death. That's a pretty right. provocative thing to say. <laughs> but, fairly basic and obvious thing to say. I suppose it is, <laughs> isn't it? But we don't want to do it at the moment. But but what were you what were you driving at? Uh, death is the is the judgment of God upon human rebellion against Him. Now, but what is death? You see, people see death as the end of life and saying, no, death is what we live now. It's not just the end. It's not just how we end. Because that is how we end, that is what life is about. Uh, it's the one universal of this world that we know is our death. And everything we are doing is heading to that. Death makes life meaningless unless there is going to be some judgment beyond death. But if the death is all there is, then life is absurd and meaningless. Everything I do winds up in a grave. There's, there's, there's nothing really in life. Um, and so all I can do is enjoy the trip, eat, drink and be merry, tomorrow I die. And that makes life relatively superficial and meaningless. Um, but when you see death as being the punishment of God, you say, well, it's not just at the end of life, it's now. What is culture? Culture comes out of the Tower of Babel. Culture is language and language is culture. It's the way we corporately think. You and I uh, share the same culture of the English language um, uh, with the Australian accent, but that means we think. You think in language. And as you think, you think commonly about things. But our desire in our thinking is to make sense of a world that is run by death. And so what we're doing all the time is making up a meaning and purpose for life other than the one that is blatantly standing right in front of us, namely the grave. And so we keep on inventing our meaning of life which is the exact opposite of God's meaning for us. So confronted by God's judgment on death, we then start creating our sense of meaning. None of them work. Can I ask None you, a, yeah, look, there's, a, there's a, a question in my mind then as to how democracy ultimately can survive the idea that we're all each our own God. Because that's another way of putting yes, it. Yes, that's right. I'm God over my life. I'm yeah. therefore God for me. Um, I suspect not a very adequate one for most people. They find that God's not quite up to the task <laughs> yes. um, when you put it like that. But here, there's a political question, and it's a broad one, yes. not a party political one. Menzies 
deeply imbued with Christian um, understanding as he was, observed that um, uh, democracy depends upon a higher authority saying that whether you like your neighbour or not, so to speak, whether they've got the same talents, abilities, wealth, whatever, standing, their soul is of equal value in my sight. Yes. Um, a higher authority saying, I'm, I'll have to respect you. Yes. Because somebody else says you're just as important as I am. Yes. Uh, can that work if yeah. we're self-referencing? No. Uh, individualism is destroying us. Um, but you, you can see it. Um, uh, society will only work with the social philosophy. The trouble is the social philosophies don't work without God. Uh, Lord Denning, the great jurist, you see, he said, uh, without God there's no morality, without morality there's no justice and we will destroy ourselves. And the individualism that's tearing us apart. See, uh, Mr Putman, the, the social capital man from Harvard, that's reflected in some of our locals, um, Mr. Professor Lee who's, uh, and, uh, and Lindsay Tanner, who are on the, the opposite side of the benches to you were, um, but they would agree, would agree with you about the same thing yeah. in the books they're saying, that as a society, voluntarily caring for each other, doing things, thinking corporately, is being washed out of our system. And you wash that out of our system it's not just you've got a problem for the Labor Party or for the Nationals. Or for, you've got a problem for democracy. Right? The alternative of socialist control is just as evil in a different way. That's the tyranny of, of, of Russia and China. Whether it's The Bible holds both individualism and family together, but family is being undermined in our society. Family, the fundamental social instruction, is is being undermined and so yeah we've each culture we create undermines us because it's not god's culture and we won't listen they work for a little while but they don't work long term and your concern is democracy yeah democracy's got a big problem with individualism massive problem interesting isn't it that uh, at one level Individualism doesn't look as though it would be um, a building block of identity politics if we're all individuals. But, yeah. but in fact, it's led to tribalism. Yes. We group with other people that I suppose we think are broadly like us to oppose everyone else. Yeah. And this tribalism seems very dangerous because well, it, it... well, It's the nonsense of social justice, isn't it? Right. I mean, there's the alternative to individualism that is around. Social so, justice matters. Yeah, social justice, well, it's a nonsense. Isn't it? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> but a person saying that we need to be socially just, it's hard to argue with that. But the social well, justice is movement... Completely wrong. But yeah. what, does the word, what does the adjective social add to the noun justice? Right. Unpack. <laughs> Well, I agree with you, I think <laughs> what you're saying, but, but unpack it, it's important. Well, that, but, but justice is giving people what is their due. Right? What is social? You're only saying social because you're not talking about what? What's the alternative? Divine justice or uh, personal justice or individual justice? or What is social? social it's like the phrase free will. The word free doesn't actually make any contribution to the concept of the word will. <laughs> it's, 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 there are adjectives that are signalling uh, approval signs, but actually are logically irrelevant mm. to what is being said. So the, the great outcome of the social justice movement has been a great deal of injustice, of course. Of course. Because it brands particularly whites as racist and racism as the cause of the world's ills. That's really where uh, the modern social justice movement uh, and critical theory comes out. And critical theory is now rampant in academia and therefore in our schools. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it's not just uh, white male privilege. Um, uh, it's the concept of uh, equity, of, of, uh, of um, 
egalitarianism, um, which they've carried into this social justice, um, which is a nonsense. Because what does it mean that everyone is being treated equally? In what sense? You see, come back to the point you were making in the first place. How can we have any ethical system without some higher power giving it to us? So you get the American Declaration, um, you know, that, that it is self-evident, which is an interesting question, that we are created <laughs> equal. Well, it's self-evidently not true. <laughs> there are some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us are good looking and some of us uh, otherwise. Some Thank of you. us are, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just not true. Some are more intelligent, some are come families intact. Come, we are not created in any sense equal. Uh, what are we talking about? The very people who are writing it own slaves, some of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Is, what, what is being meant by them? Then you go to the International Declaration of Human Rights. The opening prologue explains why where these rights are, and of course it's written directly after the Second World War, it's totally utilitarian. That is, if we want to stop tyranny, if we don't want to have to revolt against rulers, then we need to declare these things are rights. And off we go to the rights. You say, now, I don't mind the rights that they've got there. That's not the point. But the basis of it is nonsense. <laughs> it just is not true. <laughs> Because people won't face the fact that without God, you actually have meaninglessness. These are alternatives. So that the atheists will not be atheist. They will write books trying to explain to us meaningfully that the world is meaningless. <laughs> I mean, there are some. Uh, what's his name, that professor of law and philosophy at New York University who wound up saying in his book about what's the meaning of it all, his last lines are, well, it may be that just we're absurd. <laughs> you know? it, it can be that people will, but most atheists are not willing to be atheists. I'm glad because they'd be very poor citizens. But One impression we yeah. should be just absolutely clear on, though, is that, um, as you say, we're obviously, patently obviously, not all equal or not all the same. But no. we shouldn't overlook what Menzies, the point Menzies was Equality making. Equality and sameness is not the same no, thing. No, that's the point. That's the, that's that is a, the point. Absolutely critical. Yeah. And, you know, the whole discussion is mm. equality of treatment, equality of opportunity, equality of outcome mm. are completely different things. Yeah. But people have just got the word equal mm. and it sounds fair. It yeah. sounds just. At some points... It is. And the point that you're raising, um, you see, we know that God has created all of us as one humanity in his image. And therefore, there is, you can't have, you mustn't have racism because there's only one human race. The racism language is actually snuck in much later uh, previous generations would know that we are one race. But eugenics, we practice it today widely. In fact, <laughs> the atheists are very big on eugenics, on certain things like euthanasia and, and abortion. I mean, the, the, the people with Down syndrome are being aborted for no other reason than they have Down syndrome. That's an appalling thing that's legally practised widely. Now, don't be wrong. I'm very sympathetic to the problems of raising intellectually handicapped children or handicapped children of anything. And it's very hard. I know it's particularly hard on women because we have so denigrated men's fatherliness and fatherhood that men are not standing up and being the fathers they should. So then it gets left more for the women to be caring for people, for their children, who can have enormous needs and requirements. So I can 
And more than sympathy for understanding why it is that in the individual case, women will be uh, uh, not wanting to continue with a pregnancy that is going to lead in this direction. But as a social philosophy, as a policy of life, widespread abortion out of inconvenience, we're practicing eugenics. And, you know, we're very good at pointing the finger at Hitler. Um, that, that leads into, in my mind, this sort of broader question about how, what, what, what is a Christian worldview and how does it shape our world? We, we were talking there about the, the, the sort of equal value of each life, even though people are so very different. And the idea of the common law, not many people actually understand, I don't think, that the, the, the thinking behind it is that our justice should reflect the principle that we'll face when God applies his justice. doesn't matter whether you're a king and how richly you're dressed and the brand of motor car you drive or whether you're the, you know, the poorest and most deprived kid in an outback um, desert community in Australia. Some of those places mm. still break my heart. Mm. doesn't matter. Justice will be equally applied yeah. on the basis of our response to God. Um, so those sort of worldviews are very important in shaping societies and the common law is something that I think we've lost sight of. We now want special laws. I mean, today there are new aristocracies based around certain aspects of disadvantage or of victimhood. Good to want to care about them. Yeah. And to address their concerns, but often the objective seems to be to weaponize them. And the last thing some activists seem to want to do is to lift those people out of victimhood. It's big and complex. That is, uh, yes, you can see that end of the problem. The other end of the problem is we have a legal system where uh, you know, only the rich can actually afford to get the legal present representation to get a fair hearing in the court system. Now, in a sense, not that I'm not criticising the courts themselves that are trying to do the right thing, but when you make it uh, a free enterprise system as we have, um, the rich do get better representation. And so you've got all kinds of problems. I mean, I am appalled by the number of children uh, who have got uh, fetal alcohol syndrome who fall foul of the courts and are in prison. We should, no one with fetal alcohol syndrome should be in prison. It's, it's, it's a mental problem that has come through parental drinking and parental drug abuse that the child has got no control. And there are groups like this that I think, yeah, our system can do better. But when you talk about the principle of justice, yes, that comes out of the Bible that the king in Israel had to read the law, <laughs> had to write it out and then had to read it himself because the law applied to him as much as to anybody. That's a fairly radical idea for the ancient world. Mm. In fact, it's a fairly radical idea for the world mm. that the king is under the same authority. In a sense, in our Western society, we don't see it as a radical idea because that's we've always believed that you can take a president down, that you can bring the premier before ICAC or something like this. We, we, we've believed in this. But it comes out of our society. It doesn't come out of Greek. It doesn't come out of Rome. It doesn't come out of Egypt. It comes out of the Bible and the Bible's dominance in Christian West, in Western civilization. This is this book by Tom Holland called Dominion. I mm. don't know if you've seen that one or had Tom with you. Yes. Uh, He's a, he, he will be talking to him soon. I'll put that plug in. Oh, good. Yeah, he good. Will be well, I'm guest. glad you are. I've been yeah. looking forward to I've never seen him. I only looked yeah. at his book. Yeah. But, you know, he says he's an atheist. And yet he also says I'm a Christian because although I'm an expert in Greek and Roman and ancient history, I've come to understand that my value system actually comes out of Christianity. And... The, the way I treat people and the way I think about people is the Christian way of thinking about people, which he doesn't want to change. He's not saying, but 
the, the Greeks and the Romans did not care for poor people, did not care for, there was two sets of justice for the free and for the not free and so on. Um, and so, yes, our society has very strongly come from this Christian idea of a common law for all people. But we've gone off the rails on things like accepting utilitarianism as an explanation for it. It won't work. See, in utilitarianism, we lock people up uh, to rehabilitate them or to prevent them from creating the, uh, the crime to protect society, so to speak, or as a deterrent. So you've got all these reasons why we have an imprisonment system. But those reasons are false and phony. I mean, they are exactly the reasons that Stalin gave for the gulags. You've got an anti-Soviet thought, I'll put you in the gulag. That'll prevent society being affected by it. And if that's what I do for just thinking about it, what would it do if you actually did something about it? It's a great deterrent. So while you're there, I'll give you a lobotomy. That'll be the end of those thoughts. I mean, for, for the very reasons, you can only lock people up because you believe that they have done wrong, that there is a justice, that you're giving them what they deserve. But unless you've got God, What's wrong? Back to Mr. Dawkins, there is no right and wrong. <laughs> Back to, to uh, Peter Singer, you see, there is no reason for it. And that is why things like the fetal alcohol syndrome, I don't think they should be locked up because they don't understand wrong. They haven't got that mental capacity because of the brain damage done. Right? That's a, a reason for not having them there. But justice has to come out of righteousness, has to come out of truth, has to come from above. But when it does, it applies to everybody. Not the same because everybody's not the same. But it applies in the same way to everyone, irrespective of whether they're king or they're pauper, as you put it. Let's then come to some of the Bible uh, uh, verses that, that people will have still vaguely heard or be conscious of, I think, and get you to tease them out briefly. Um, the first is, the truth will set you free. What does that mean? <laughs> Jesus says it in uh, John 8. Yeah. But they don't give you the whole quote. Um, let me see if I can do it from memory. Jesus is saying... Uh, if you keep my words, you will be my disciples uh, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So it's not just truth out there somewhere, my truth will set me free and your truth will set you free or something or other. It's Jesus is saying he is the way, the truth and the life and he will liberate you. The freedom that he then goes on to talk about is the freedom from our captivity to sin and to Satan, uh, the, the devil, the father of lies, uh, and from death. So, yes, the truth the truth will set you free. So it's it's great statement of Jesus, uh, and a great statement in John eight that is really what he's come to do for us. Mm. Here's another one from Matthew. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Yes. That sounds pretty challenging. Yeah, no, it's a good one because uh, it, it comes, it, it's, it's used about half a dozen times by Jesus, but in Matthew's Gospel, you'll find it at the end of the passage about the rich young ruler, which I think is chapter 19 in Matthew. Um, uh, and uh, the last verse, see, this rich young man who's got everything going for him comes and says, I want to have eternal life. And Jesus says, you only lack one thing, give everything away to the poor, come follow me. And the man won't do that. So he goes away sorrowful. And the disciples then say, well, uh, you know, how come? Jesus says, with the rich um, can't enter the kingdom of heaven. To which the disciples said, well, who can? He said, they haven't got the common law yet. They haven't understood, mm. right? To which Jesus says with... Man, it's not possible. With God, all things are possible. 
Uh, it's the passage about the, the camel going through the eye of the needle. And, but the point is, those who are first in this world, rich young rulers, <laughs> they're going to be last. And those who are last in this world, nothing of no consequence of significance, they will be put in the first. He then goes on to tell an, another parable in the next chapter and concludes again with this, this same point that the, the first will be last and the last will be first. That there's, with the kingdom of God, there's a complete reversal of value systems. Let me come to another one. Greater love hath no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, John, uh, the gospel. Jesus is, uh, the night he's betrayed. Did he have any friends? Uh, he still had his disciples, and they were his friends, and he called them friends. Uh, not just uh, uh, disciples, but my friends. Uh, see, John's gospel, 20 chapters. The first 12 tells you about what Jesus did for three years. And then chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 just tell you about one conversation he has with his disciples. And it's in the middle of this very important conversation. And then chapter 18, he's betrayed and in 1920 he's killed and risen from the dead. But this is the chapter that explains what it's all about. And he's saying to his disciples, you must love one another. That's the sign of being my disciples because love is what the whole thing is about. And he's expressing true love, real love. The greatest love that we will have is to lay down our life uh, for our friends, that you're willing to give up your life because love is not warm feelings. Uh, love that he's talking of is self-sacrificial, is putting the other person first, even to the point of dying for them. Now, of course, uh, you've got to put it in its context. There are other places where you'll see there is a greater love than that. That is the love he was having, namely dying for his enemies. His enemies, yeah, <laughs> that's the interesting one. Which is even I mean, more. It's Paul, isn't it, who says, you know, yeah. a man might lie, might in certain circumstances lie for, die for a friend, yep. but he would hardly die for an enemy. Yes. Uh, and yet, as I understand it, we're all at enemy with, with, with God. That's whom he's dying for, yes. He's dying for, yeah. 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 So he dies for us while we're not yet his friends, yes. in one sense. It's even more extraordinary, isn't it? But yeah. uh, then you're not dealing with man at that point, you're dealing with God. <laughs> to Genius. die for your enemies, that's even beyond what is the best love. I was raised in a, in a, with a song in my Sunday school days. The perfect, the perfect uh, love, uh, the perfect friend, the one who knows the worst about you and loves you still the same. There's only one that loves like that, and Jesus is his name, his wonderful, wonderful name. You know, people talk about unconditional love, but Jesus' love is even greater than unconditional because he knows actually how bad we are. <laughs> and our, our worst feature is our enmity to him, and yet he still loves us. And that, Philip Jensen, is the message of Easter? Absolutely. It's the, see, the death and resurrection of Jesus hold together. Right? If it wasn't for the fact that he died for the sins of the whole world, he would still be dead. But he did die for the sins of the whole world and paid fully for us. And so that's why death could not hold him. The new age of the resurrection, the new age of the judgment of the world commenced with his resurrection. And so the Good Friday Sunday is, is held together. Because he died for our sins, he has risen from the dead. He not resuscitated. Lazarus was resuscitated, but he died again. Jesus rose for eternal life into a new age the age in which we are entered into when we're born again by the Spirit of God, the age of eternity. So I, I am already in heaven while I sit here. That is because I've already come into the new age through the resurrection of Jesus. That's why I know I'm going to heaven when I die, because when I die is no longer of great significance now because I live in eternal life. This is just basic Christianity. But we live in a society that is so censored 
basic Christianity, people don't know about it. This is the issue. It's not understood. It's not understood. It's not even known. My, my dear, one of my daughters went to a selective school here in Sydney in year seven. She's given a history book, an ancient history. It's about Egypt and Greece. Egypt and Greece have played very little part in making Australia, Australia. But we're going to teach the history. I'm all for learning Egyptian history. I'm all for learning Greek history. I've studied both in different ancient history courses. But Christianity, I said, where, where's the Jews? The history of the Jews. The Jews have played an enormously significant part in who we are as a culture. The Jews aren't mentioned. Is Jesus mentioned in this book? This is the only ancient history course she did. Is Yes, he's mentioned. Once, about page four or five, it said, the reason we think, we name things BC before Christ and AD, whatever that means, is because in other periods of time, people thought Jesus was the most important thing that happened. But we don't now understood. That's the only reference in history that my child ever received about Jesus in our selective state public school system. That was the only reference that she ever received. And how can you teach Dunn's poetry without knowing anything about Jesus? How can you read Jane Austen without understanding anything about Jesus? How can you learn the history of the Western civilization without knowing anything about Jesus? Well, I, mean, I, I, could, I could respond to that by saying <laughs> we don't learn about those things anyway. No, no well, that's the consequence. We don't read them. That is the consequence. We don't know. We don't understand. But you see how Jesus has just been censored out for a variety of reasons. Uh, our fights between Catholics and Protestants is part of the reason. We're to blame to some extent that we removed it from our education system. But it's, it's been purposefully omitted and continues to be omitted in our society. And then we wind up with people in the society not really knowing about Jesus and yet knowing enough to not want him. <laughs> I'm always struck, I mentioned C.S. Lewis, by the sheer simplicity and undeniability, can I use a bit of bad English for a moment, uh, that uh, you're confronted with a problem. Who is Christ? He plainly lived. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, he plainly existed. So who is he? Because he's either who he said he was or he's on the level of a man who thinks he's a poached egg. Um, we can't have this idea that he was just a good person. That idea is not open to us. He claimed to be God. What he said was unbelievably provocative. And people who are just good teachers are not still, it's still the majority faith system in the world today. We think in Australia that the faith is dying out internationally. Of course, oh, it's not. It's far right. from. Yes. So I guess that's the ultimate question uh, each of us needs, if we've heard that name, to face our responsibility to think through how we're going to react. 30 years after he lived and died, there are enough Christians in Rome for the emperor to blame the Christians for the fire in Rome. What happened in 30 years to turn a group of Jews into, into being Jewish Christians? Remembering who the Jews are, who for centuries had fought to maintain their Sabbath, their distinctiveness, their, their, their own monotheistic view, to now accept a man as God. Something happened. <laughs> And that something that happened, whatever that something people may say is, has changed the rest of our culture and our world to this day. So that he is the best known, most followed person in the world 2,000 years later. To be ignorant of what possibly could have happened at that time is a terrible lacuna in our thinking and education. Isn't it? Well, it's a, a black hole. People really do need to go back and look at who Jesus was and what he did, what he said, what happened, what happened to him, 
that can explain how within a generation, 30 years, you and I know 30 years is not long ago. <laughs> it's not hard to remember 30 years ago now. No. It's for some young people who are only 25. But, you know, if you're not wet behind the ears, 30 years. And the world is being turned upside down by a man who was executed. What happened? Thank you for watching this episode. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe, and join the conversation. Thank you.